Thank you all for inviting me here. Um, I am deeply honored by your attention this morning. If folks on the margins are always uh, just hoping for a little attention. I, I had a 16-year-old gang member, a very earnest fellow named Louie, who was standing in front of my desk, and he said, look, I need your divided attention. <laughs> I said, you are in luck because that is exactly what you'll be getting. <laughs> uh, I'm particularly privileged to uh, congratulations to the class of 2016. You know, what Martin Luther King said about church could well be said about your time at Pilgrim. It's not the place you've come to, it is the place you go from. And you go from here to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it, which is God's dream come true which is the only praise God has any interest in that we somehow create a place of kinship here and now. And so we're all asked to uh, imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. And so we're called to dismantle the barriers that exclude and to stand at the margins because if we stand there, the margins get erased and we stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, and we stand with those whose dignity has been denied, and we stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. We get to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop, and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And we stand at the margins, all of us, in our way, and we brace ourselves because people will accuse us of wasting our time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. So this church and pilgrim school is not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And you stand against forgetting that we belong to each other. And that's partly because the covenant asks us to do that. God says, as I have loved you, so must you have a particular special preferential love for the widow, orphan, and the stranger. Because God knows that this these three groupings of the poor know what it's like to be cut off and because they have endured that particular suffering God thinks they're trustworthy to guide the rest of us to kinship. Recently I was in Houston and a very earnest young man who was working with gang members in the streets of Houston says how do you reach them I said, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? That's the only thing that matters because if you allow yourself to be reached by folks on the margins, by the widow, orphan, and stranger, then that is a, a moment that is exquisitely ennobling where everyone gets returned to themselves in the grace of mutuality and that's what you hope for. Not to save the world, which is what we kind of always are inclined to want to do, but to savor it, to allow yourselves to be reached by folks who are most likely to guide us in a trustworthy way to the kinship which is God's dream come true. It is, in fact, the only praise God has any interest in. I, not long ago, I was interviewed by a nice Christian lady on, on the Christian Broadcasting Network, and she asked me what we do at Homeboy Industries, so I did a whole litany of everything from tattoo removal to job training, from therapy to case management, from our seven social enterprises to a heal, healing community of tenderness, and I, the list went on, and the lit, litany finally ended, and she looked at me like she maybe had smelled something foul. 
And she scrunched up her face and, and she said, yeah, but how much time do you spend each day at Homeboy Industries, you know, praising God? And I said, well, all damn day. And, and I think she didn't like that answer. <laughs> but anyway, we can nudge ourselves closer to kinship and connection. That's the praise God has some interest in. There's a homie named Danny who works at Homeboy Industries, and uh, he's 20 years old, but when he was 13, he said, I will never step foot at Homeboy Industries. I knew him in the streets. I knew him in the alley where he would kick it. I knew him at juvenile hall and probation camp, and he finally went to prison. He was a knucklehead into his gang, and, and he went to prison for two years. When he got out, he discovered that his mother had six months to live, so he sat by her bed and cared for her. And in recovery, they always say it takes what it takes. The death of a friend, the birth of a son, a long stretch in prison, or your mom dying of cancer. And I buried her, and a week later he walked into my office, and he works there now with his enemies, with rivals, with guys he used to shoot at. One day he came into my office, and he's sitting in a chair, and he said, what happened to me yesterday has never happened to me in my whole life. And he said that he had gotten on the Chinatown stop on the gold line to go home, and the train was packed, but he got a seat, and standing right in front of him, hanging onto the pole, was, he said, was a medio pedo guy. A guy was a little bit drunk, and he was hanging onto the pole. And he said he was a homie, a gang member, because I could see tattoos on his hand, but older than me. And Danny was wearing a shirt that said, Homeboy Industries, Jobs, Not Jails. And the guy hanging on the pole says, you work there? And Danny doesn't know whether to exactly engage him, and he, he nods. It any good? And Danny shrugs and he says, I don't know, it's helped me. In fact, I don't think I will ever go back to prison because of this place. And then Danny stands up and he reaches into his pocket and he finds a piece of paper and he gets a pen. And he writes on this piece of paper the address at Homeboy Industries. And as he's telling me the story, he says, I couldn't believe I knew the address by heart. <laughs> and he hands it to the guy and he says, Come see us, we'll help you. And the guy studies the piece of paper and he thanks him. And he gets off the train at the next stop and then Danny sits down and then he starts to get emotional and he says, what happened to me next has never happened in my life. Everybody on the train was looking at me. Everyone on the train was nodding at me. Everyone on the train was smiling at me. And for the first time in my life, I felt admired. And suddenly kinship so quickly people receiving each other, which is exquisitely ennobling and also the only praise God has any interest in. It, it occurs sometimes to universities to force their students to read my book against their will. Uh, I'm not complaining, but Gonzaga University I did that a couple of years ago, so all the freshmen had to read it. They said, come up and bring two homies with you. And I always pick homies uh, who are enemies, rivals with each other, so that they have to share a hotel room just to mess with them. <laughs> and I always pick homies who have never flown before just for the thrill of <laughs> seeing gang members panicked in the sky. So I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. I, I brought these two guys, Bobby, African-American gang member who worked in the bakery at the time, and um, Mario, who worked in our uh, retail store. And um, 
I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times, men and women, and, and, but I've never taken anyone as terrified of, of flying as this guy Mario. I mean, he was, he was hyperventilating, you know. He, ah, he, and we hadn't even gotten on the plane yet, you know. <laughs> so we're at Burbank Airport, which is a tiny airport and big bay windows and Southwest Airlines, and, and they don't have that hermetically sealed chute where you you know, walk onto the plane. You have to walk out onto the tarmac like the President of the United States and you climb up the stairs, front of the plane, back of the plane. And so I'm there sitting with Mario and, and our plane arrives and I said, here's our plane. <laughs> like he might not live to walk up those stairs. And so um, I, I see our flight crew is coming and, and two flight attendants, females, both have very large cups of Starbucks coffee and they're schlepping up the steps uh, to get on the plane. And Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? I said, as soon as they sober up the pilots, uh, <laughs> th there, there they go now. I probably shouldn't have said that. So I should tell you that Mario is one of the most tattooed individuals who ever worked at Homeboys, which is saying a lot. He's all sleeved out and neck all black with the name of his gang, head shaved, covered in tattoos except for like a little circle, uh, eyes, nose, mouth, but everything covered in tattoos. And I'd never been in public with him. And, and as we're walking through the airport, people are like this, you know, and uh, mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely. And I'm thinking, wow, uh, that's interesting. If you ask anyone who's out there selling stuff, who's the most gentle, kind uh, homeboy at Homeboy Industries, they won't say, they won't say me, of course. They're going to say, Mario. He's so kind and so gentle, and uh, even as terrified as he was on the plane, you know, he, the flight attendant would hand him uh, peanuts, and, you know, she was handing them to him, and, uh, and, and he wouldn't just take them or thank, thank her. He would grab her hand and look her in the eyes and, thank you so much, <laughs> just like over the top, you know. So, so we get to Gonzaga, and of course, what do they do? They, uh, you know, you have the big talk at night, but they also have... 94 other talks that they didn't tell you about. You know, this class, this class, this meeting, this lunch. So I told Mario and Bobby, I said, look, I'm not going to speak in any of them. I'll be in the back of the classroom. You're going to get up and tell your stories. I'll just listen to you. And so they were terrified, especially Mario. But they did a good job. They got up and told stories of terror and torture, of abandonment and abuse and violence. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, You'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. So the nighttime talk came, and there were a thousand people there, just packed, and, and I was supposed to do my 45 minutes, and I said, why don't you guys get up first and do a little five minute, so they get to know you, and I can include you in the question and answer, and they were nervous, especially Mario, but they did a good job, and so I did my thing, and then, okay, yeah, question, yes, ma'am, and a woman stands, and she goes, yeah, I got a question. It's for Mario. First question out of the gate is for Mario. So the three of us are standing up there. Mario goes to the microphone. He's this tall drink of water, very skinny. Yes, and he's terrified, and he's trembling. She goes, well, you say you're a father, and you have a son and a daughter who are about to be, enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you give them? You know, what advice uh, do you supply them? And Mario stands there hanging onto the microphone and he's just trembling and he's getting a hernia trying to come up with the answer. And, and I can feel the emotion taking over and suddenly he blurts out, I just... And as soon as he says those two words, he retreats back into his closed-eyed retreat. And he trembles some more. And finally, he wants to get the sentence out. And he looks at the woman and says, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence. And the woman who asked the question, now it's her turn to cry. And she stands, and through her tears, she says, why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are gentle. You are kind. You are loving. You are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. 
and a thousand total perfect strangers stand and they won't stop clapping and all Mario can do is hold his face in his hands so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself because they had allowed themselves to be reached by him. And that's the only praise God has any interest in. We go out to the margins not to save the world, but to savor it, to allow the widow and the orphan and the stranger to guide us and to allow ourselves to be reached by them. And then we're all beyond caring if anyone accuses us of wasting our time. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. This place, this school, is not the place you've come to. It's always been the place you go from to make those voices heard.